This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. You've heard others, but nothing could prepare you for the shameful stupidity that is the Jock and Nerd Podcast. Here, Imran. So if you offend everyone at once, it all it's a wash. I've covered everybody. Anthony. Sorry, I was texting. Say that again. And Rug Boy. Yeah, whenever there's a snowstorm, my slack hole tightens up. As they talk over one another. Just exactly uh, the same Connor as, was J- the as Terminator. We're talking over each other. It's fine. Sorry. Swear. I had boobies. And ask you for money. Just give us the money. Witness the hubris as they claim to be the world's authority on comic book movies. Who said that? Never said that. You've never said that. Who cares? A jock said that. Comic book, TV, movie, reviews, news, and whatever they choose. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. The Jock and Nerd Podcast. It can't be silly, goofy fun. Seriously, people really listen to this. Uh. Jock and Nerd! 2020 is half over, and the things that dominated our stories and conversations have been largely left behind. We decided to take a moment and review the first half of the year and what's still relevant, even if it's fallen victim to our short attention span culture. Hi, I'm Eric. And I'm Aisla. And together we are the hosts of the Bicurian Podcast. Bicurian is our answer to the polarizing culture we live in. Tired of feeling under siege and looking for ways to get involved? Then come be a part of a different way of thinking. Everything from politics to geek culture to current events that polarize us as a society. We explore multiple ways of looking at things. Welcome to the show. Welcome, everyone. So... This week, we started the conversation talking about all of these interesting things that we've completely forgotten about this year. Yeah, it it seemed like there were things that were dominating the news cycle that I actually forgot occurred. And then, you know, it randomly I remembered or something showed up. I thought, whoa, like, it, that's kind of intense. And so we decided that it would be an interesting conversation to kind of look at the first half of 2020 and review some of those things. We probably won't get to all of them. And sort of where are they at? Well, that's the thing, right? This this show conceptually came from the idea of just remembering that there was other things to remember in the news cycle that are not coronavirus. And not to discount anything with Black Lives Matter, but but it's those two things that have really dominated the news cycle for the majority of the year. Um. And so we just, we wanted to catch up on things and kind of remember some of the other things that happened. I will say that, you know, we're roughly halfway through, a little more than halfway through 2020. Um, I look back at the things that were happening around Christmas in January, and it feels like that was a lifetime ago. It it really does. Like March didn't feel like a month. It felt like a decade. You know, just every single moment. Well, life shifted then and and i mean arguably um you could say permanently i would say permanently because what was going on on march 1st and how we ended at the end of march seemed like drastically different worlds well and they were i mean i don't know that so when wuhan shut down and that was i have i have a little cheat sheet for myself so i can remember what month things occurred in so we're, um, we're going to invite everybody to come down, a stroll down memory lane, and and really the point of this show, again, is to remember the things that we we're forgetting. Yeah. So we do have some notes. Um, I love that you wrote this out. Yeah, but thanks. <laughs> and but so like Wuhan shut down, and I remember thinking to myself, "Oh, that's amazing," and I can't imagine that ever happening in the U.S. And and well, it didn't happen with nearly the level of uh, commitment. And oh, one oh. might say effectiveness. We, it it we happened. We're, we're going to learn that. <laughs> we're going to learn that. But it did happen. Things that I never thought would ever happen happened. You know, our taxes were delayed. You were mentioning the NBA, you know, sort of canceled its season. They're they're talking about reopening. But things that we just in a million years would, you know, the, the Olympics were postponed. Stuff we just never expected. So, and there's there'd be so much. It it First of all, if you name some event it was canceled that happened right. um i actually just read the other day and this was this was all over the news cycle 
but again, like three or four stories deep. So if you didn't scroll down, you might've missed it on any homepages, but um, Broadway in New York is not reopening this year. The soonest they're going to consider doing another show is January 3rd. Well, you said early on 2020 is the year that didn't happen. And and in in some ways, that's that's true. Obviously, there's some other things that did happen that were kind of a big deal, and we'll obviously reference those. But I was, I was looking at this uh, article that I found, and, and it indicates the first major event of 2020 was, I don't know if you remember this, the Australian brush fires. Like, So as a question, is Australia still burning? It's winter there now, just to put it in perspective. <laughs> right. And it's saying, like, we so it's probably not are. on fire, just like the U.S. catches fire most summers. So does Australia. Um, I don't know the answer to that. But yeah, you're right. That was a big deal. Coronavirus, I remember in in that first week of January, I was like, oh, this is a thing. This could be like SARS. This could get really scary for some very specific parts of China and Asia. Mm-hmm. Right. And I do remember noting that it was kind of scary and, and, and it got scarier as the news cycle continued. But at the time, it wasn't the number one news item. If anyone can remember this again, a lifetime ago, the number one news thing at that time was a little impeachment that was happening right? because they had used basically the Christmas break in the Senate and House to gather all the documentation. And so that when they went back to work, you know, solid two weeks into January or whatever, it, it was, it, it, it was a small pop, not a big bang, but they finally had taken that all in, but it was all anyone could talk about was when was Pelosi going to pass over the information? When was the Senate going to actually hold the hearings? Were they going to hold hearings? It, I think that's when we were trying to figure out if we knew what uh, collusion meant and, um, that with the influence, the business uh, term that. Now I'm spacing it too. Darn it. We'll get back to that, but not, not fast. I'm not going to waste time but trying you know, to figure it out. That's, but- that's again, one of those things <laughs> that like seemed to be the most important thing that was going on at the time. And. Well, and it, it, at the time it was. Well, but again, and- I, like I said, I remember thinking coronavirus was definitely kind of interesting. And it had been a while since we had had swine flu or bird flu or SARS or mares and thinking, oh, we might be a little bit due. It's just interesting because I am, I am actually recalling my mental state from over six months ago. Right. And just remembering that I, I did have some initial concerns, but yeah, no, they, it seemed like government news Trump's impeachment, that was all the big deal. Right. Well, and the, I want to say the article that I read about COVID, because I was watching it and I was definitely more concerned than I would normally be. Well, in be. January, that's when they gave it the name COVID. Right. No, it was actually later, but. Um, really? Yeah, it was a February. Who names COVID-19? Yeah, yeah no. I, <laughs> that's why I have a list here because they are blend together. Um, But it was, and I don't have this written so i'm i'm trusting my memory which is also dangerous but i feel like it was end of february beginning of march that i read the report that said there was a there was a initial finding that covid-19 could spread asymptomatically and that's the one that caused me to be like okay what are we doing i recall hearing about that in the beginning of march yeah. because that was in my mind coinciding with the WHO declaring it a global pandemic. Now, I realize as I say that, that I think it was probably into the second week of March, they called it a global pandemic. Yes. It, well, no, they had named it a pandemic. I have this for us. Uh, oh, you're right. In March. Mm-hmm. Good job. <laughs> so we're, we're doing, this is also a memory test for us, apparently. Because even is. though I wrote this down, I don't remember it either. <laughs> um, there's another one that happened in, in January, two more, three more. So um, we assassinated the general 
um, oh, of yeah. Iran. We almost started a war. Yeah, we we did that. We I remember we had to let them just shoot some random missiles at one of our bases and blow up a few uh-huh. empty buildings. Like they there, shot- there was very few people wounded. Um, and and it was accepted that like if we didn't let Iran do something to retaliate, it would just be bad for geopolitical mm-hmm. machinations. Well, and then they also accidentally uh, shot down a Ukrainian plane. Which ironically, I think actually cooled that whole thing off because that actually got the people in Iran mad at their government. So the government was suddenly on thin ice. They were not going to do, and this is a big, you know, wag the dog, saber rattling thing. You got to have your people backing you if you're going to start saber, rat- saber rattling. And the the problem with that Ukrainian plane is that it wasn't filled with Ukrainians only. It was filled with a lot of Iranians. They mm. shot, it's a Ukrainian airlines plane, but they killed a lot of their own people, their own citizens with that. Right. And so, but that's all, I mean, that's all kind of a big deal. And I honestly didn't remember that until I went through and was looking at the news and was like, oh, that's right. Like I was really terrified for a few weeks that we were about to get into another bl- bloody conflict. And I was also honestly very upset that we randomly assassinated someone from another country. <laughs> that seemed really out of, out of line. Well, but. it it did. But also look at that. There was a certain amount of Trump was trying to overcome all of the impeachment, impeachment yeah. press and everything and show some sort of power. So and it's funny because we're trying to go through things that are not covid related and it's really hard not to just keep coming back to covid because it as every day ticked on in 2020 up until the lockdown, it was like this oppressive thing building. Yeah, it wasn't. And it, it, it was very slow uh, in some ways to to um, come through. Uh, so so the, that there was that sort of Middle East thing. And then um, other two things that happened, Mexit and Brexit. Uh, Harry and Meghan stepped down from their royal duties, something that almost never happens. And the UK finalized its move out of the EU. Yep. Oh, big deal I remember, situations. Yeah, I remember them. What's interesting is that Harry and, and Meghan haven't really left the news cycle completely. I still see little updates about them. Yeah. And and they're more of a human interest story. I mean, it doesn't affect health, politics, all of that sort of thing. So it's interesting mm-hmm. to see that that is something that I still have seen in the news cycle. You know, they they moved to L.A., I think, or Canada did something. Oh, they absolutely moved to L.A. I absolutely follow them. I don't know why. Possibly I have a royal thing. I don't know. But definitely I have a Meghan Markle thing. I became a huge fan of hers uh, when I started reading her blog. She's just very thoughtful. It's interesting, though, because you can. A long time ago. They, they haven't stopped that coverage. Yeah, she doesn't have, I don't think she, I don't know that she has a blog again. Cause she had to put, put that all away when she joined the family. It was very sad. Very sad. However. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, that you know, so that whole situation, um, and then there was the um, first United the first first COVID case happened. I want to say the end of January, wasn't that right? Like January. Uh, no, because they just found out that somebody had it in February, but they were really counting the first case. I think it was like the tail end of February, early March. That was that. No, this is it. First coronavirus case in the U.S. is reported in Washington State, January twentieth. See, and that felt like that came along. So, but yeah, no, because that was in the old folks' home that um became sort of the epicenter in mm-hmm. in King County. Yeah, and that's you know, there's a brief period of time where Washington was the center. Um, and then uh, now I do remember this. This was when I think everybody, whether you wanted to or not, really started paying attention to things. January twenty third, for those who don't remember, Wuhan, China went into full lockdown. Yeah. I was impressed. I was like, I was like, wow, I don't even know how that happened. Well, my initial thought was that could just never happen in the U.S. Right. We're not an authoritarian enough government. And frankly, I didn't trust American people to be respectful of that sort of thing. I mean, right. you know, part of the culture in China is that supporting the state is your duty. Mm-hmm. And you are just, gra- that is ground into you. And I mean, with the threat of violence at times. So- for what it's worth, uh, during things like a pandemic, that can actually have a positive side effect because they did 
completely nip that thing. When you now look at the numbers, like China isn't even in like the top 20. Right. Well, and I was reading a Chinese commentator who's saying like, uh, because she's also for like freedom of Hong Kong. And so she was saying like, on the one hand, people sort of use the fact that China could lock down the way that they did and stop the disease. She's like, yes, there's a benefit. Yes, we were able to build, they were able to build 11 hospitals around Wuhan to deal with the patients. And so, and because- In a week. In a week, because the rest of the country had been pretty much prevented from too much outbreak. And so all of the construction workers and medical providers and everything could go to Wuhan to focus on that area. Mm -hmm. And And most of those people didn't get sick that were building because they had contained it. And those hospitals were built in places where they didn't actually interact with too many of the people that were sick in Wuhan at the time. Right. And so it's like, and so she was like, on the one hand, this is really great because on the other hand, it leads to like massive atrocities. So it was kind of interesting to hear her perspective. Um, and and also the other question that that has been raised is while the numbers for China are low now, there's some question about the accuracy of reporting at this point. Yeah, they definitely do not want to be at the top of the list. So, you know, that's the reality, I think, that I've come to face in the last two weeks, seeing that our numbers are growing in the U.S. and knowing that like Brazil's probably caught us, even though the, their reported cases are about half of ours. That's mm-hmm. still a lot because we are a lot of cases right now. Yes. We but they're not... also intentionally not covering all of that stuff. And yeah. for what it's worth, it, it you have to acknowledge that the problem with this is that it, it, it the leaders of the countries are afraid to look weak. Because I, Trump's dealing with it right now. He's being accused of mismanaging everything, right? Because the numbers are so high. Because he mismanaged it? Exactly. But I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the, like... the, the evidence that he can't refute is that it's so high. So he's trying to downplay that. So when you see people like Bolsonaro um, and, you know, these other more authoritarian um, leaders of countries, you, you can understand their motivation to right. not report. I, I just want you to notice that you equated us with these other authoritarian countries very naturally. And I'm not I'm just saying that's kind of something that's happening now. We we see ourselves more uh, politically can similar. I, yeah. Can I just state that the difference between us and Brazil is a few degrees of latitude? Yeah, exactly. Like it's not. And that's the thing that I also think is a very interesting thing to have revealed. And I think this process has revealed that we don't have the the fascism yet or the authoritarianism yet to be able to lock down and get the benefit and get the hospitals <laughs> But but we do have some of these liberty um, reducing behaviors and exploitive behaviors from authoritarian leaders, and we so do. it's kind of upsetting. One of the key things, and I should state that I uh, the company I work for has an office in Brazil, and I can speak very freely with my coworkers down there, and they'll be the first to tell you that one of the key differences is that they have pretty much state run media, so they don't get all the news. Yeah, I don't think we do either. They have free press, but it is much <laughs> more controlled. Uh, we do, but of course, it's constantly being undermined. And 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 one of the differences is, rather than just having one source of news that's probably lying all the time, we have multiple sources of news that are probably lying, depending on what their spin is. It's a I lot more confusing. Know, yeah, yeah, I don't know if it's better or worse. I, I do believe in the freedom of the press, so I'll take... I'll take the responsibility to sort through the news that I read in this. And, and we covered it on the show ages ago now, the whole um, media understanding your media, media yeah. bias and things like that. And I just accept that, you know, if I want to read something that was posted on or comes from Infowars, I n- know roughly where the source material is coming from. Right. I'm not going to say it because we try to keep the show clean. Um <laughs> so another thing that happened in January, which was really sad, was we lost uh, Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi in a helicopter crash. I was having lunch when I read that yeah. at a restaurant. That probably wasn't the last time I was in a restaurant, but it's the last time I remember being in a restaurant. And partly because, yeah, I was reading that story and it was really sad. But, yeah. Yeah. And it, and then the other thing, uh, the Iowa caucuses, the the debacle that they were. Uh, with regards to them being like, oh, so and so won. Oh wait, no, wait. Oh, we have some missing the you know re- uh, reports or 
you know, things turned in. It's like, well, wait a minute. We don't understand what's happening. <laughs> it, the, the Democratic Party really did not do a good job. No, it did not. And I will say that I had this fear, I remember around that, that it was just going to be a cluster of problems mm-hmm. with this election cycle. Who, who, who could predict in what ways, you know, Russia or China might interfere. All of that stuff was on my mind. And somehow in there, once the com- country went on lockdown, I became a lot less concerned about that. And to be honest, I don't know if that was a wise move on my part. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like that's another one of those areas. It's, it's sort of what prompted us to even start thinking about this episode was, what are we not paying attention to? Right. Well, and it's it's like we're really clear, you know, there's there's so many voting issues because people are trying to deal with social distancing and, it, and every state, of course, has to make the call and, and each party is making it. And, yeah, you know, and it's a mess because that's how we like to do things. We like to do things messy. But somehow we got through the majority of the primaries without it being really, really, really bad. Yeah. Um, we just finished our primary here in Colorado. It was mostly mail-in ballots. I think it went well. But. I mean, yes. We're used to mail-in ballots. Yeah. I mean, that's fact. And, and the. Um, and but so- interestingly, like we've, we've done them in Colorado for years and years and years. Like I can't remember the last time I voted in person. I've pretty much had a mail-in ballot sent to me. You don't even need an excuse. You just sign up for it and they send you a ballot and then you drop it in the mail, or you can even take it to a polling station and hand it in in person. But um, I do know that that's the thing that I'm starting to see in the news cycle right now on the more right-leaning side of things is that mail-in ballots are the devil and they're the cause of anything bad that's going to happen to any Republican candidate. Right, which is, the study, study after study has shown that they don't actually um, provide any benefit to either party. It's some of my some of my liberal nor, friends nor like have to they say, been proven to be any worse for fraud or anything like that. They're no more likely. They're actually so here's the thing though that's important to remember, I think, is that the states that currently have systems and structures in place for uh mail in ballots and, and primarily mail in ballot elections. Colorado is almost a completely mail in ballots with some ways that people can go and pick up a ballot if they need to. Washington State, the last state that I limbed in with the same thing, all absentee ballot. And there's a few others that do that, and they do it quite well. Um, however, the concern that people have have expressed that I do feel is something worth noting is that the states that have not been doing this infrastructure, that, that don't have the procedures and, the, and everything in place, they might be more um, susceptible to fraud because they're trying to do something new, that, that... not because they're doing mail-in ballots. <laughs> and I think it's important to note that distinction. Well, and and I would guess— my gut says that fraud is probably less of a concern and more just mishandling of the situation because they don't necessarily know how to actually do it. Yeah. That, I, that seems to have been like, I think Georgia kind of had that issue. Like they just weren't, they just didn't have the experience necessary to make it a smooth process. So, I mean, which, so- which of course will invite people to say, well, it led to fraud. Why wasn't it? I mean, sure, you can say it led to anything, but. Right. So, for the most part, studies have shown that mail in ballot elections are not particularly susceptible to fraudulent uh, exploitation. However, I think this election cycle, no matter what kind of election procedure is used, because people are going to be trying to deal with the pandemic as part of it. I think we're going to see some hiccups. I don't I don't think we're going to avoid that. We've already seen it with the primaries where people are waiting at polling places and or not, excuse me, uh, voting places. But because the um, because they were trying to do social distancing, they maybe only had one physical place or something like that. And so um, and there are some questions about how those decisions are made, whether it's bias motivation or actual attempt to disenfranchise voters. I think it's probably honestly a mix of both. Um, it does often disenfranchise poor voters, people of color, immigrants. And so um, none of that's news, though. Right. No, that's news. But I'm just saying like the, those the, the, the reality is that I think we are going to see more concerns because we're trying to implement new systems. And, yes. and anytime you do something new, there's going to be something that doesn't work the way you expect. Well, the Iowa caucus part of that's why that happened was they used an app that they didn't properly test. Yep. Oops. 
<laughs> yep. No, and that's the thing. There's going to be a lot of untested systems, especially as we get to the main election this year. Um, since we're talking about the past, I brought my crystal ball to talk about the future. And oh, cool. Okay. I can already tell you that based on some of the responses I've seen, all of the right wing folks, um, in addition to being mad at Trump for not really having a platform at all currently, other than he's Trump and he's done a great job, yeah. any news bite you get, he's going to say that. They're all blaming his bad polling, which is ridiculous, on mail-in ballots. So just be prepared for that news cycle because they are already looking to just blame anything that they possibly can for why they're not doing well. Yeah. They're not in polls. That's fact. But let's also not forget that um, Trump never in a million years, especially at this point in 2016, five months out, roughly four months out from the election, he looked like he was going to do fine too, or, or he wasn't going to do fine. Hillary looked like she was just rolling Yep. at this point. So just be aware that just because those poll numbers are not favoring him right now, um, I refuse to believe he doesn't have more rabbits in the hat he can pull out. Yes, I agree. I, I, you and I have talked about this before. It's really sort of frustrating when people diminish his intelligence and then assume he's going to be easily beaten and then talk. I, I'm just like, dude, nothing's changed. And the pandemic has changed. Like we actually have something different. The Black Lives Matter movement and the pandemic, I do think have shifted the landscape. However, um, up until that, nothing had changed. No. And we're still not sure that's going to have an impact. Yeah. It has changed in so much as that, based again on polls, which are not necessarily always accurate, the moderates that went Trump in 2016 seem to be swinging away. And as bad as coronavirus is, the one thing that it has done is make everybody very aware that we are lacking leadership in this country. And healthcare. And yeah, well, lots of things, but but the leadership is the thing that I think has actually really gotten people's attention is the lack of leadership because things aren't just getting better. And the moderates, it does not going to take too many moderates to swing it back. Yeah. Well, I mean, hopefully. So I'm going to move on to February, my favorite month of the year, because it's my birthday. Um, Trump is acquitted. It's a bummer. As we said earlier, uh, the WHO named the virus COVID-19. And this is a big one that I forgot, actually. Weinstein was found guilty, which shocked me. Yeah, because that, I, I guess I just assumed he was found guilty ages ago. It was. It was February. Yeah. <laughs> but he finally went to trial, and, in, and it was a, it was a in moment. In New York. In New York. Yeah. And it was a moment where I was like, wow, like, the evidence was so big. There was clearly, like, you know, a lot going on. And I'm just so used to those guys getting away with it. That when I saw the title first come across, I uh, a headline come across my feed. I was like, "Wait, he what?" <laughs> so I I didn't think he was gonna actually get away with it. Well, I I but you know, I mean you're not wrong. He did become the scapegoat, and much as I have talked about with the Me Too movement, one of my big fears is that we're gonna absolutely nail a few people really hard and then shift away from it being a thing so here's to hoping that other predators that have been called out and might be awaiting trial or have yet to be called out and should go to trial will not fall out of that pattern because it has been a positive thing yeah one of the things that happened in it was either march or april i think it might have been april because i think it was after we'd had a month of lockdowns possibly it was may we had an entire month of no school shootings. And all we had to do was close all the schools. Well, that's a little baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> it was kind of interesting, though, because somebody posted there like, oh, my gosh, we had a whole month of no school shootings. Because even in February, we had like four mass shootings. I don't know if we had school shootings. I'm sure we did. And suddenly, everyone's on lockdown. No one's in school. No school shootings. <laughs> it's like we thought we'd have to take away guns. Instead, we just had to take away school. So... I thought that was funny in a painful way, and I wanted to share it. 
Was there anything else in February? Because I can't think of anything offhand. Um, there's the you know there was a a bank uh Boy Scouts of America filed for bankruptcy. Mm. Um, there were multiple mass shootings. Milwaukee. Um, there was two in one day. Yeah. Um, there was one in Atlanta restaurant. Let's all remember before we get so excited for everything to go back to quote unquote normal, what normal was. Yeah, that's normal. Another, normal. That's another thing that I'd like to bring up is that when we have talked about our personal opinions that the world has changed, not all of that is entirely negative. No, it's really true. Like there is, I mean, and that was kind of my, you know, I, I, it, it was interesting and not amusing in like a, a mirthful way, however amusing that it we we can stop them by having people stay home. And I'm just curious, like if people live in a world where that's not happening, will they appreciate that? Right? I mean, to a certain extent, no. We've already had shootings at protests. Um, so that's a thing. Yeah, the protests have taught me one thing that there's a lot of people out there that are really, really happy to be having their voices heard and there are still plenty of people who feel that acting out violently is a perfectly reasonable answer to everything right so so uh march italy was the first country to do a national lockdown now that's when i had the idea that the u.s might do a lockdown because italy is not an authoritarian government Right. But they do have a lot of national pride. And so when they were asked to do that, there was plenty of people who were kind of upset about it. But in general, the majority of the population understood the importance of doing it. And it was bad in Northern Italy. It was bad. You know, it dropped out of our news cycle to see the hospitals over there and to see the people that were locked down. But we did have a good two weeks of seeing that and it was bad. Yeah. Well, and that was one of the things that um, was when they first started kind of trying to change the language, because I think they recognized we weren't going to stop the virus from coming into the country and we were likely going to see a lot of cases. However, that whole flattening the curve language has started because they were like, we don't want to, we don't want this to happen. What happened in Italy is that because they didn't, and you know, not to blame, but just they didn't control the spread. And there were a number of factors that led to that. Um, they ended up overwhelming the healthcare system. And because, and so more people died than might needed to, more people suffered than might have needed to because they didn't have the um, spacing. Well, and the horror story. From that, to your point, was the doctors having to make the decision to not even try to help certain people. Right. They had to say, this is who we can help because of time and equipment. Time, equipment, beds, age, all of those sort of factors and Mm -hmm. stuff. That's when we got this rhetoric going that this primarily affected old people more so than younger people. And that, I think, was... One of the big mistakes that the media latched onto, also the idea that you'd be showing symptoms, was was coinciding at the time with Italy had talked about at that time, that there were people who were spreading it asymptomatically. Well, we're, I think one of the things that we're used to as modern people is knowing things. We usually know things. And so... Most of us are are quick, and I think that you know the media is people, right? Um, they they're quick to assert what they think they know, and and so we're, we're grabbing on to you know what's going to work, or what we need to do, and you know that's why the toilet paper thing was insane. But in the end, coronavirus is completely unknown. It's still very unknown. Like we went from thinking of it as a respiratory illness to to learning. Um, that it causes uh, heart attacks and strokes, as well as uh, lung failure. Um, and it might be autoimmune related in some way, because it seems like that's what's actually killing people is their autoimmune response in their lungs. But then there's also a possible brain issue. that's cr- Like we just, we still don't know all the things that are happening with this. And we're just not used to that. Yes. And we're not, you know, we're used to understanding, oh, it's if you're if you're sick, then you're pat well, nope, this one doesn't work that way. <laughs> like there's so much about it. 
that is a new discovery. And, and for that reason, I think that, um, I think that's part of it. Cause like you said, people lash and look old people, you know, elderly. Well, yes. Pe- the, and those were always statements that were meant to say, these people we think are more susceptible. Everybody can get it. And, and people weren't even paying attention at the time that when people were saying elderly, the reason I didn't use that term is because people were using the word old. And that's because they were lumping in basically anybody over 50, mm. which, to be honest, is not old. If you're 20 something, it looks old. But let me just assure you, as somebody in my 40s approaching 50, 50 is not old. Definitely. I'm right there with you. <laughs> but and, and they had numbers that said, yes, your chances of, you know, falling on the wrong side of the mortality rate increased in every decade over 50. But the reality is they, that's not even elderly. Yeah, no. 50's not elderly. No. So, again, that's one of those areas where I feel like the media and what people wanted to believe really failed us in getting us to where we're at right now. Right. Well, the, initially, the first big concerns were the Dow, right? Like, people were like, oh, we're going to de- re- depress. I'm like, I don't think that's even the thing we need to worry about right now. Like, Well, there was millions of people lost their jobs instantaneously. Right. And, you know, the government did some basic stuff, like not that it's covered everybody, but the stimulus package was, I think, is the reason that we are reasonably functional as a country. I I think that package made it possible for businesses to get here. I think we need more personally, but I think it's the reason we're not in that terrifying depression everybody was thinking about because they're right. That does cost lives, too. But we can control the economic impact. That's like people are saying, like, the, the lockdown is going to you know cause economic problems and it's it's also going to be a health hazard. Yes, but we can control the impact of that. Yeah, we can we can keep businesses going. We can give people money and food. What we can't do is suddenly create more medical workers, more equipment, more beds. <laughs> so that that's the stuff that we're actually that's our actual limiting resource. And that's what we have to control for. Yeah. And so at any rate. But I do think that the big things that happened in March were when the NBA canceled oh, yeah. the games and the NHL did it, canceled everything the next day. That is, I remember having a physical reaction to that. I, I realized that this was for real. This was happening. And my slight nervousness suddenly shifted to... I, I will be honest, it was fear. I genuinely was afraid. I had no idea what was going to happen next. Yeah. I mean, it was a it was a very frightening situation. I was devastated. I was supposed to drive out and see my daughter, and I didn't really know what was going to happen, no, but we, I was concerned that there would be lockdowns and I might get trapped somewhere. We both had trips scheduled that had the events around them had gotten canceled, so we weren't even sure if we were going to go on them. But yeah. I remember thinking to myself, I'm betting we're not even going to bother trying, even though it was like a convention. And so it made sense that that got canceled relatively quickly in March. And it was coming up in May. So, you know, they had to make a call on it pretty quickly. But I remember thinking that at that point, whether we locked down like Italy or Wuhan, the things that I was going to be wanting to do Mm-hmm. was probably going to shift in accordance with acknowledging what the new reality looked like. Whether or not our country would be smart enough to lock down or to try to actually get control of things, I figured I would be making intelligent decisions for my own health and the health of the people around me to avoid getting sick. Well, and... It, some of, I mean, some of the things that we've seen, right, like the governors that took action to lock down their cities or states, some of them got sued because technically those things aren't legal. And and it's for me, it's a really tricky balance because on the one hand, I felt like absolutely it was necessary. I wish we had locked down faster, harder, and for a lot like longer in the beginning because I think we'd be in a much better place right now. However, I also understand the people that don't want to give the government more power because, frankly, if they take power, they keep it. And I don't want to live in that kind of authoritarian world. So I, it's tricky for me because I felt like recognizing we had an emergency situation that required that kind of precision was in you know direct contrast to my also concern about governmental overreach. 
I completely agree. I, I am not a fan of government overreach, but I will fully say that I expect there to be laws on the books in most states governing uh, emergency declaration around pandemic that is going to give them power to shut things down. I would say that in most places that might come a year from now, but given the fact that we're not even to the fall when cases were supposed to increase, according to all of the experts begin increasing, mm-hmm. if we were reopened, we're, we're in the middle of summer and it's already happening and people are already walking back things. Bars and restaurants are closing down in a lot of cities and stuff. And and right now it's not like global nationwide. It's small areas. And by small areas, I mean big cities with millions of people and other. But contained. Yeah. You know, it's not but, it's but not yet collapsing. That dominoes. could change mm-hmm. really quickly. And so I would dare to say that, you know, state legislature is probably going to go into effect in the next couple of months and start passing some emergency declaration pandemic response powers. Mm-hmm. It would be, actually be nice if somebody sat down and like drafted them out so that it could be, you know, like, you know who it should, who it should be? It should be Fauci, who is my new favorite hero. Uh- <laughs> you know, and it's going to be political. Some states problem. Are, are not going to do it well, but I could see California really kind of leading that charge yeah. of creating emergency power to prevent the spread of pandemic. Do you remember when it seemed like California was going to secede? And and the only reason we were upset about that is because we don't live there? <laughs> Man, it was a adventure. And instead, what happened was we now have districts. If you haven't read The Hunger Games, go check it out, because now we've got districts in our country that are coordinating yep. because our federal government would not coordinate the you know responses needed. Yeah. So. But I think I think we're, you know, we're not even going to have to wait for history to repeat itself because we're going to we're going to enter a period here very soon where this has to just happen again. Yep. I'm again, not excited about it, but. Um. So April, we actually already talked about all the things in April, except for... Um, it's hard not to. Yeah. It, the census kicks off. I think it kicked off in April. Um, it's happening. Somehow they're doing the census. I guess they do it by mail. but <laughs> Online. And so There's a website. Yeah, there you go. So that's happening. Um, the May, I remember, started out being all about reopening. And should we reopen? Yeah, there's all these conversations about, what you know, what should we do? Yeah. Um, and but I do feel like everything changed yet again mm-hmm. right at the end of May because yeah. that was on Memorial Day when George Floyd was murdered. Was murdered. And if I'm being honest, I think what led to the outpouring of support and and all of the actual rage from people who frankly, hadn't been raging for the last five years that Black Lives Matter, and even before that, well, so had been, been going on. The first five months of the year when we had the two other shootings, yeah. Breonna Taylor, I mean, it's, and then... Um, Being on lockdown packed a lot of rage that people were looking for an excuse to pour out. And I guess if there's a silver lining, that's not a bad one. Yes. Well, and I think that... Um, you know, sometimes it's because as someone was asking, I'm trying to remember if you were part of this conversation or not, but someone was asking, like, what happened with the Vietnam War? Like, how did it go from being something everybody knew about and it was just some fringe radicals who were like, we have to get out to suddenly being like, oh, this is bad? Because we absolutely shifted as a nation and then vilified the soldiers. Like, they had a, a rough situation, right? Because they left in a flurry of, um, patriotism and celebration right and they came back uh at the end at any rate to this like level of like rejection and and sort of questioning their own commitment to their country and to the service that they took on and so we're saying like and this uh friend of mine was talking about having talked to their uncle about being a, pro- a war protester a vietnam war protester and how did that conversation change and he said it it really was like we did it we, we talked about it we talked about it we talked about it and then one day it was different <laughs> and and he's like, and different people will point to different events that shifted it. He goes, but I just think we finally reached that tipping point that they talk about. And I think that's a lot of what happened with Black Lives Matter. Like, it, yeah, as you said, it's been, you know, 
five years, 50 years, 400 years, like there's, there's a lot of time estimates where people have really been addressing this issue and, and somehow all of the right things came together because it, it, it is different this time in that not only, not only is there more momentum, there were 18 countries protesting with us, having vigils for George Floyd. Like it was a global response to the atrocities occurring here in our country towards our black citizens and our black residents. And that's And even different. acknowledging their own internal racist cultures, which I think is great because, you know, other countries have things that are, have happened in different ways, but it, it woke everybody up globally, which is fantastic. Right. But I do actually fear that in some ways now we are paying the price because of all of the mass gatherings and all of that stuff. Like that was not supposed to happen even under the most laxed versions of reopenings and masks and stuff were worn that I saw for most people. But I'm really hoping that we don't pay a price seeing cases skyrocketing based on those mass gatherings of well, coronavirus. And the, the protests in Minneapolis, actually they did some contact tracing and they said it didn't seem to have a huge up uptick because the protesters were, for the most part, socially distant, wearing masks outside, that they actually said it had seemed to have a low impact. And it's been a few weeks now, so they can kind of start to assess that um, on the, the cases increasing in that area. So that's kind of like, I think, interesting. It's like I look if if that does not become a thing. Again, I'm looking in the crystal ball, the, the things we'll look back on, and, and I'm hoping that it doesn't become something like, well, we were good till that happened. I don't think it's as dramatic as that, but it, it's just a concern. But likewise, I keep on thinking, oh, hey, we are, you know, maybe this is winding down. We are not at all. It was only a few weeks ago that here right in our backyard in Aurora, Colorado, a bunch of violinists and other protesters were out in front of the Aurora Police Department. Yep. And the police just said, okay, it's now illegal and just tear gassed all of them. And it's like, okay, you know, I actually had some faith and maybe our police in this state were not that bad. Well, there was the incident in Denver where there was the uh, black woman lawyer who was part of the Denver City Police um, Task Force. And was there when they said, like, these are the uh, protocols we're going to use. And she really felt like she had, was providing, um, like, a, a genuine feedback and support to um, make things better. And went from a meeting to a protest and was shot with a rubber bullet. Yeah. And wrote this article saying, I'm done. I'm out. I'm not. I'm." And she filed a lawsuit. Or, you know, she supported the people. She's like, you guys are saying I thought I was helping you to do this better, but you're just using me as a token. Done. And all of this is to say that I don't think we can let our foot off of the gas on the protesting and on the trying to get heard because things are not changing, really. No. So. Well, and that's, yeah. And so um, so keep that up. We're for it. Uh, and then the other things, there was the earthquake in Idaho. Yep. Which I never expected. Um, the asteroid in June that passed close to the Earth. On my birthday, June I know. 5th. <laughs> and what I loved is you pointed out that when they revealed it on June 7th, it wasn't even top of the fold, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I was pointing out at the time, you know, this was a month ago, at the time that an asteroid that almost hit the Earth, it passed closer than the moon. Extinction level event. And we did not see it until two days afterwards. And that was third on the list of like front page news. Although I'll be honest, I have a conspiracy theory here. I just don't think they tell us if they can't do anything about it. What's everybody going to do? Exactly. Panic? Right. I, th I think that, I think if they see it, they, they just don't tell us if there's nothing, if it's that close. They're just like, let's not let people worry. They have enough on their plate. It's a pandemic. Yeah. So... So that's the first half of the year. That's our recap. Um, what I would actually say is that something that this has been a good exercise for me in the last week since we started talking about this and, and putting the show idea together 
it's made me scroll down a little bit farther to make sure I actually am kind of paying attention to the other things that are happening. Because on any other day, things that are third, fourth, fifth down on the list would be front page news. So it's easy to get caught up. And, and I all, I'm going to also say that I think everybody needs to be paying very close attention, especially to the local news of what's going on, because the reality is you might be living in a place right now that the cases are skyrocketing and it may not be on the national news channels like CNN or, or whatever your news source might be, but you will definitely hear about that sort of thing in the local news and following your local politicians. So that's, and that's the world we live in. Like Mm -hmm. we're going to have to take some responsibility. And I think we also need to take responsibility to pay attention to other things just because they're not front page, top of the fold on the website, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's good advice. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks everyone and and hopefully 2020 continues to get better. Yes. Uh if you have ideas, feedback, thoughts, please find us on social media. We are by Curian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or you can email podcast at bycurian.com. You can also give us a call at 720-507-7309 and if you like what we're doing, please rate us on your listening platform of choice. Thank you. <laughs>